now and I'll hand over to Thanos to get started with the presentation. Yeah, okay. Um, hi everyone, can you hear me? So if you can hear me then I can proceed. Yeah. Yeah, we can. Great. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I would like to thank Helen for uh, inviting me to give this uh, like said, talk and we debate about this uh, very topical issue, which somehow is neglected, uh, in at least within the field of innovation studies for several decades. And, and I think it's becoming more and more popular. Uh, it's been covered in the media as well, but uh, also in terms of studies and in terms of policy action. So we see growing interest from policymakers on the relationship between innovation and equality, because somehow our economic system, the global capitalist system, produces more inequality and, and wealth at the same time, whilst being more and more innovative. So we see these paradoxical, let's say, features of economic development in contemporary societies. And, and in this talk, we would actually, in this debate, we will discuss a few key explanations uh, why this is occurring and what are the policy implications. And I would also uh, provide a few insights from a, pro a, project, a project that I conducted, a research project, which is actually a case study analysis on one of the most innovative regions in Germany. So Germany is one of the most egalitarian economies in the world, but as we will discuss later on, that even in this kind of country and this type of economic system with, let's say, low inequalities, we see a lot of causal mechanisms operating, causal mechanisms of inequality, but also mechanisms of equality. Um, I'd like to start from providing a background, a bit of a background on this topic. And, and I think the best way to do so is to refer to the Silicon Valley region. I mean, the Silicon Valley case has inspired policymakers across the world. I think for, at least in the, in the last decade, everybody wanted to copy the Silicon Valley region or the model behind it and replicate it across the world. And it's been this, let's say, Silicon Valley fever but, uh, but actually, this kind of role model, uh, let's say, uh, passion, uh, the passion to copy that model, uh, it's actually neglects the fact that even in Silicon Valley, we see a lot of inequalities. And uh, also inequalities that are actually growing and rising, but also striking at the same time. For instance, there's been a, a kind of a report on Silicon Valley that one out of four citizens in the Silicon Valley uh, suffers from food insecurity and hunger. So I have here just a little graph, uh, which is actually a map of the Silicon Valley region and also the main city, the, the main parts of the Silicon Valley and then the main uh, companies or the most popular companies, which are actually multi-billion companies. So we see that, for instance, where Google or Yahoo or Apple allocated actually 20 to 30% of their habitats are visiting food banks on a regular basis. One explanation for this uh, situation is that uh, the housing prices are very high in Silicon Valley, but then the counter argument is, is that, you know, one of the most affluent regions in the world where innovation is abundant, where a lot of tech-savvy people are there, they haven't sorted these issues. I mean, people are struggling, and I'm sure those who visited uh, Los Angeles and Silicon Valley, you see also a lot of homeless people there. So this is an interesting case because I think we don't really take into account, to say, the counter side or the negative side of innovation and wealth. We're looking only at the positive side of the story, or at least we used to, and now we need also to be more holistic. I think, in a sense, we need to go back to Schumpeter and, and look at innovation as a creative, creative destructive force, and I think this is a holistic perspective on innovation. Um, then the question is, so what we observe in the Silicon Valley region, is it a generic phenomenon of the economic system or something that applies only to a few US cities? According to the OECD, actually this is a generic uh, pattern or a generic phenomenon in OECD economies. Uh, when we look at the statistics, income inequality statistics, especially the, uh, the uh, percentage of, of people who, the top 10 uh, income earners and then the rest of the population, we see that the, this is growing. We see that, for instance, in the 1980s, the 10% of the wealthiest people and actually seven times uh, more than the uh, the rest of the population. And in 2010, we see that this rose to 10 times. So I suspect in the early 2020s, uh, now times, and because of COVID, this must be much, much higher. What is interesting about the OECD is that we see a paradigm shift. Uh, OECD used to, uh, 
regarding rising inequality as a good thing in the sense that it motivates people to do the right investments, the right choices. But what we also see now is that not only from the OECD, but also from the European uh, Union, the European Commission and other policymaking organizations, we see that inequality is a bad thing or rising inequality is a bad thing. So we no longer regard rising inequality as a good thing to growth. We see rising inequality as a problem for growth. And I think the title of the report, the recent report from the OECD, Why Less Inequality Benefits All, I think is it actually says it all, that we have a paradigm shift uh, in terms of policy action. Then, um, so why this is occurring, why we see rising inequality across the OECD economies, there is actually several explanations in the literature and we can see the more traditional explanations such as the declining union membership. We see that for instance, and we see it also in the UK where the uh, union, uh, trade unions or labor unions have less and less members. Uh, we see it also in a sense that because of the declining uh, labor union memberships, we see also the declining union, uh, sorry, excuse me, wage, uh, minimum wage. Uh, this is another explanation why in advanced economies uh, we see these rising inequalities. Uh, another group of studies, most political economic studies and sociological studies attribute rising inequality to financialization, the increasing financial interest in the economic system. And another group of studies, mainly economic studies, tell us that rising inequality is due to international trade, especially from low cost countries such as China and also the uh, there are some in Latin America as well, the rise in, in BRICS in general. Um, then another group of studies tell us that, oh, it has to do also with rising immigration because we see a lot of rising immigration to advanced economies and that could be a possible explanation. Another explanation which I have actually underlined in, in, in bold is technological change and innovation. And I will talk more about it in a minute. Uh, and then the last explanation is neoliberalism and this dominant discourse on neoliberalism, which has ended up in welfare state retrenchment. We see that the welfare state is, is a, let's say, less powerful as it used to be, even in traditionally, let's say, egalitarian countries or social welfare countries such as Sweden and Germany. Um, but when we look closer to the literature, we see that the consensus is that innovation drives rising inequality in contemporary societies. I would say there is more like a consensus on innovation and technological change, whereas there is less consensus on the rest factors, uh, apart from financialization. But even studies on financialization underline that innovation is a driving force. Um, now, so, on the right side, I have included a graph of published contributions on innovation and equality, especially contributions that then uh, use innovation and equality on the title. As you can see that in the 90s, it wasn't so popular, this topic, but started to grow in mid 90s. And then we see there's an explosion of it, um, especially in 2020, there were more than 50 uh, published contributions on this topic. Uh, but when we look closer into the literature, we see that uh, there are three main accounts uh, on innovation equality. By accounts, I mean theoretical perspectives. So most of the studies, unfortunately, are informed by the first account, which is from the field of, uh, or originates in the field of uh, labor economics. And then the second account, which is less popular nowadays, it used to be more popular in the past, is the creative class externalities. And the last one is the risk reward nexus from uh, Mariana Mazzucato and William Lazonik, and I think this is more closer to the field of innovation studies. Let me say a few words about each of those accounts and, and what actually each account tell us about uh, the relationship between innovation and equality. According to the first account, innovation leads to inequality through the skill premium. The skill premium basically underlines that uh, Innovation benefits more the skilled labor, the productivity of the skilled labor relative to the less skilled labor. And, and therefore, a skilled labor is a, it's, it's more in demand uh, than the less skilled labor. Because the skilled labor is more in demand, then the wages rise for uh, the skilled labor. Um, implicit in this account is that uh, skills are necessary to develop or use innovation. Uh, of course, the definition of skills is very narrow, more like formal skills, more like formal education, rather than, I would say, practical skills, because somehow we regard skills only when we hold a degree. Uh, 
by we, I mean in the literature. Uh, but in reality, we know that skills can be very practical, very informal. Um, somehow, the skill-based account uh, it was very popular until 2010, um, but then uh, scholars, especially economists, look closely into the labor market structure and they saw that there is a labor, let's say, polarization, that we see more and more uh, people holding degrees and people, on the other hand, who hold no degrees. And the people who hold degrees, they get also sometimes unemployed. So why is this is happening? And, and the explanation that is developed is that uh, innovation, especially robots, uh, hence the title robots uh, in my presentation, um, so we replace more and more routinized jobs or tasks that as employees we perform on a daily basis that they are standardized. And, and, and therefore, innovation or technological change in particular has become more routine biased in the sense that it replaces jobs that they perform routinized tasks. And, and it's interesting if you have time to look at the Frey and Osborne paper, which I have also included here, where according to their estimations, one out of two jobs in the US are going to be replaced by a robot in the next uh, decades, I think two decades or latest by 250. This is a, an interesting explanation that brings us back to the work of Karl Marx, the technological unemployment threat, and which actually re is recurrent every time we have a technological revolution. Um, the second explanation is also an interesting explanation because it underlines that uh, inequality is rising in cities, uh, especially in cities that they uh, attract a lot of creative employees, the Bohemians as Florida. Uh, calls it. This is more like a geographical explanation why inequality rises and how innovation affects. According to Florida, uh, innovation is becoming more and more creative and more knowledge, knowledge intensive. And because of that, it requires a lot of skilled labor or people with creative skills. And, uh, and these people tend to live in cities that those cities provide a lot of amenities. And because of that, uh, actually jobs in these days, according to Florida, go to the people rather than people going to jobs which used to be in the past. And because of that, uh, Florida assumes that rising inequality is an externality of two main classes, the creative class, the creative employees, and the service workers. Um, when we look, for instance, at London, we see that there's a lot of people who work in creative uh, industries, but also the, the finance, which according to Florida is also a part of the creative class. Um, and then on the other hand, we have a lot of restaurants and uh, a lot of cleaning services and a lot of also other services. Um, according to Florida, this leads to rising inequality um, because the service class workers uh, have less income and, and also they get less paid relatively to the people who belong to the creative class. There is some debate on that, how we define creative classes and, and who belongs to the creative class, which I can't uh, cover in this talk, but it's an interesting debate. And I, I certainly agree with a lot of scholars who criticize uh, Florida's approach. The last explanation or account for why innovation leads to inequality comes from Mariana Mazzucato and, and, and William Lazonik. Um, this is closer to neo-schumpeterian economics and innovation studies, and I'll, from the three accounts, I'm let's say more, let's say fond of the of this of this the, the risk reward nexus. According to this risk uh, reward nexus framework, is innovation is a collective process. Innovation is a risky process, and because of that, uh, innovation allows certain actors, especially venture capitalists and shareholders, to acquire a substantial uh, portion or share of the rewards that innovation generates. So according to Lazen Gamazucato, this is sort of an extraction process, an extraction mechanism that leads to inequality. This is an interesting uh, account which somehow is not applied so far. So I think one of the main limitations of this account is that we haven't really applied it systematically. In theory, it's an interesting account and gives us an interesting perspective that they are consistent with the theoretical core of the field of innovation studies and notion material and economics, but somehow we don't have enough studies to see how this performs. Um, so the, hence the question for our talk today. So from the three accounts here, so when innovation induces inequality, is it because of skills? Is it because of robots? Is it because of bohemians, as Florida tells us? Or is it because of risks and rewards? So this was 
Uh, this question actually motivated a significant part of my PhD thesis, but also a paper within it. And I would like to share a few insights from a pro project, actually a paper, uh, which is now a paper, it used to be a pro project, uh, which I've also uh, Actually expanded in another region uh, of Germany uh, recently, but for now we focus only on the region of Brunswick in Germany. And uh, actually, I'm sure uh, most people or most of the people who join our talk don't know about this region because it's largely unknown. But it's uh, actually it's quite impressive that. Told me. And what is interesting about this region is that more than 8% of the GDP, the regional GDP, is dedicated to R&D. Uh, in monetary terms, it's about 6 billion uh, euros uh, in 2017. This is an impressive number. What is also impressive about this place, which also attracted uh, my uh, the research is that uh, this region is actually one of the most innovative in Europe. Uh, actually, it outperforms according to the European uh, scoreboard uh, places like such as London, Amsterdam, and even Berlin and Paris too. So uh, it's a quite impressive uh, to see that in a small region such as this one, there is a lot of innovative activity. Um, this also actually uh, led me to the observation that there must be the hypothesis, there must be a regional innovation system behind it. By regional innovation system, I mean uh, certain actors interacting regularly and, and therefore producing more innovative uh, products and services than in other places in Germany. Um, so the question or the purpose of the project was to find out how the regional innovation system of such a small region affects the distribution of income. And, and in doing so, I wanted to see also which of the main theoretical perspectives actually explains best uh, the, the experience in the region of Brunswick in Germany. So the data I used well, actually was, or the data collection process uh, was based on interviews and with several business people and policy makers and uh, labor union representatives, technology transfer officers, and organizational documents such as annual reports of their firms and uh, other information from the official website of policy making organizations and also uh, newspaper articles about the firms. Um, in addition to that, I triangulated this qualitative part of my analysis with uh, data from the Eurostat and the German statistical services. And here is actually some interesting insights about how an innovation system or the regional innovation system of Brunswick uh, leads to inequality or equality. Because I, will, I was actually, I will show you there is not only a number of mechanisms that leads to inequality, but also a few mechanisms that lead to equality. And actually the existing literature neglects those. Um, so I will start from the first mechanism, uh, which I discovered. Um, it's about the competence concentration and in the region. The region of Brunswick is a kind of polycentric region. There's a lot of cities, like so seven cities, but somehow the innovative activities, especially the functioning of the innovation system, is concentrated in the main cities, in the three largest cities. Um, this actually leads to the competence concentration in those cities, and especially in one of the most important fields of knowledge in the region, which is mobility, the mobility sector, the automotive and, and train technologies. And actually what I observed is that uh, this field has emerged uh, through interactions between the main actors in the region of Brunswick, the universities, the firms, and the local policy makers, and, and actually, there was a set of policies uh, which was actually more like core periphery policies that facilitated this process, the process of concentrated innovative capability in the large uh, cities. And, and over time, this has led to rising inequality among the cities. Um, I'll give you an example. For instance, the most affluent city in the region, the income per capita is 150,000 uh, euros per year. And the least, I would say, uh, affluent city in the region is 22,000 euros per year. It's so, like the, the income gap between the cities has risen in the past two decades significantly. Um, this is the first mechanism that I identified. The second mechanism 
which is like I said, it's a very interesting mechanism and to a certain extent confirms the risk reward and nexus hypothesis is that the innovative activity in the regional brands bike and the functioning of that system in there uh, benefits and at the same time is benefited by the activities of large firms, especially the Volkswagen, uh, which is actually one of the largest car manufacturers in the world. Um, what happens is that um, according also to the interviews and also to the data that despite there are several uh, small firms, innovative firms in the region, approximately 250 active firms uh, innovating, it's the largest firms that are central to the innovation process. Uh, in fact, that without the large firms in the region, there's no innovation. This is actually what most of the interviews told me. Um, at the same time, because those large firms are so profitable and so like very powerful and and leading firms, what of revenue uh, revenue streams? So actually, those firms have become the target of top income ex top uh, executives, and also the, uh, the the compensation of those executives has increased significantly. Um, I will give you for instance an example. In 2005, the CEO position. Uh, at Volkswagen, um, I'd say uh, the CEO earned approximately 150 times the average salary in the firm. Um, in 2019, it was something 250 times. So this was not only specific to the regional, to, to firms such as Volkswagen, but also to other firms in the region. Um, this also led to a significant rise in, in the number of high income earners in the region, and this also led to inequality. The third mechanism is a precarious employment mechanism, and I think everybody is familiar with this. So I won't spend so much time on this, but what I observed is that the adoption of innovative technologies, especially robots, um, leads to technological unemployment uh, for certain groups of people, especially low-skilled people. But policy makers and also some firms in the region feel very responsible for this situation. So they introduce policies uh, or they introduce uh, new jobs in services because they want to have people employed. Uh, but these jobs are usually not well paid and they are also part-time jobs. And that has increased also the relative poverty in the region. Another mechanism, which I say is very interesting, um, sorry, Successfully, is old age technological unemployment. Uh, we see that there's a lot of robots uh, in the production line, these digitalization technologies as well, implemented by firms. Uh, but actually what happened is that a lot of those technologies, um, when they're implemented, they make unemployed older people, especially low skilled men. Um, but at the same time, those men have no possibilities, career possibilities in the region, because there is not actually a plan a strategy to integrate them back to the labor market or to uh, the firms. Uh, when you look at the statistics, you see that uh, the percentage of people earning no income, have no income in the past decade has been actually tripled. And what is surprising is that uh, this happened to the less or to, to the least affluent cities in the region. So these people who get unemployed, especially male, uh, low skilled male over 50s, 55 and, and 65, uh, actually they have no chance to get back a job. And, and basically the, this uh, leads to chronic unemployment. And the last mechanism that leads to inequality in the region is skill premium. The skill premium mechanism is the same one like the uh, technological bias or skill bias technological change that I referred to earlier on. Um, but what is interesting here is the strategies that firms uh, perform in order to tackle skill shortages. Um, uh, they use the classic uh, institutional arrangement of vocational train training that Germany is well known about. Uh, they use also other policies such as, you know, forming a, a group or a network of firms and then small firms and then offering training programs to young graduates and vocational training programs that they promise them long-term employment. But what is interesting is that the large firms such as Volkswagen and also Salzgitter AG, which is the second largest steel maker in Europe, so what they do, because they are under pressure, they, to, they want to catch up with digitalization, but also the electric vehicles, in the, in the case of Volkswagen, they pay significant amounts to get young graduates. Like, uh, according to my analysis, it's at 70,000 euros, 8,000 euros per year, is for what Volkswagen pays to get talented, uh, young, talented uh, graduates from the local universities. So what is interesting is that in this 
city, like in the city of Braunschweig, there are three main universities educating 30,000 students. At the same time, there is say, approximately a 27 research institutes. So in a small region such as the Braunschweig region, we see that there is a lot of uh, knowledge, but also skilled people in there. But somehow, those skilled people are not staying in the region uh, because they prefer to go to uh, bigger cities that they are more interesting, such as Berlin and, and Hamburg and Frankfurt. Uh, so for Volkswagen, because it's actually located in Wolfsburg, which is a city next to the city of Braunschweig, uh, they have to pay higher amounts in order to attack these people. Um, and actually, this leads to a problem for smaller uh, firms because they can't attract or retain skilled employees. Um, but if they do so, they have to also pay a premium. All this leads to higher inequality in terms of income in the region. Now, what is surprising is that is the two mechanisms that are identified that they coexist with the other mechanisms of inequality, and, and those two mechanisms lead to equality. And those two mechanisms relate to gender, and what I actually observe is that on the one hand, we have the creative destruction of skills due to technological change, but at the same time, a lot of firms perform uh, gender inclusive uh, skill building strategies or employment strategies. Volkswagen is a great example. They want to increase the number of women uh, in the R&D department, but also in, in the management, in the top management. Um, other firms, do the same thing, but also there is pressure from the uh, uh, from national the national government to incorporate women in in the board of directors. Um, but despite that, uh, local policymakers as well want to attract more and more women. And the reason, one of the main reasons for that, is that they realize that young couples uh, who actually uh, are skilled and educated um, don't like to to live uh, in such peripheral places. Especially women uh, don't don't like because basically they don't have career opportunities in the big cities. So they realize that and they try to, uh, they create synergies among the local firms and organizations and they try to create like uh, gender inclusive employment programs, such as when a woman works um, in a firm, then they provide also free uh, this uh, nursery or kindergarten, as they call it in Germany, sometimes within the firm, even small and medium sized firms provide this type of activities. So in order to make the employment more female friendly. Um, so what is interesting when we look at those seven causal mechanisms, and actually this is missing from the literature, is that there are several, several mechanisms, and those mechanisms are triggered uh, by the strategies that the focal actors in the innovation system utilize in order to deal with the creative destructive nature of the innovation process. Um, I think this is something missing, and also what is missing is that we have knowledge only perhaps of one or two mechanisms, but not of those seven mechanisms that they coexist, sometimes they counteract or complement each other. I think this is an interesting finding that emerged from the analysis. Um, what is also interesting is that we see that uh, those seven mechanisms can be in the same place, but can be undetected if we just uh, pursue only a statistical analysis. Um, Perhaps here there's a methodological lesson that when it comes to the relation between innovation and equality, context is, is of significance and, and instead of eliminating it in our analysis, we have to embrace it. Um, now we'll just go briefly to con concluding remarks and because I guess there will be time for questions and answers. So let's, let's revisit the main question that I posed at the very beginning of my presentation is when innovation induces inequality, is it because of skills, uh, the skill bias? Is it because of robots? Is it because of bohemians living in certain cities? Or is it because of unequal uh, risks and rewards in the innovation process? So based on the uh, say experience in the region of Brunswick, uh, what I could say is that it's neither skills, nor robots, or bohemians, or the risk rewards, but certainly the mix of organizational strategies that focal actors in innovation systems perform. And when those strategies, uh, say, combine with the abilities of an innovation system, namely the ability to facilitate the innovation process, uh, this leads to certain causal mechanisms. Um, what does this imply in terms of policy? Because one of the main reasons of this uh, discussion today is to discuss the policy implications. So one good way to do this is to just uh, compare briefly um, the 
three main perspectives uh, in the literature with uh, the perspective I took in my analysis, the innovation system perspective. So according to the skilled biotechnological change, the best way to address rising inequality in innovative places is to increase the number of skilled em employees or the skilled uh, uh, students or to increase in general education. Somehow this contradicts the statistics because in most OCD countries we see that the government spend less for education. Um, at the same time, the uh, skilled biotechnological change account implies that one way to uh, facilitate uh, or to improve uh, the skill shortages is to basically increase the labor market intermediation. Obviously, the skill biotechnological change account is an account that, by being informed uh, by mainstream economics, focuses too much on the market. So it doesn't take into account uh, less uh, non market, let's say, non market factors, including organizational strategies. Somehow the organizational strategies are regarded as homogenous, that all firms perform the same type of strategy, profit uh, optimization, basically. Uh, according to this creative class externalities, so if we want to reduce inequality, and this is what actually Florida suggested is the creative class should perform this kind of voluntary role. And he provides an example where he helped his uh, sort of, you know, cleaner at home in, in uh, which actually was a lady from Latin America. And he said she was a very creative lady. So I helped her to uh, enroll for a course. And then I actually, I uh, she uh, created her own company, uh, interior design company. That's what Florida suggests. So he doesn't like uh, he doesn't like the traditional, let's say, institutional policies like increasing the uh, increasing the, the labor market participation or, in particular, like trade trade union uh, memberships. But he seems to change his mind over time because in his recent publications he suggests that. Uh, increasing the number of memberships, uh, labor union memberships in service sectors might help in big cities. Um, the risk reward nexus tells us that if we want to uh, reduce inequality in innovative places, we have to uh, basically lead to a more fair uh, resource allocation. We can increase taxation. Uh, we can also, uh, as policymakers, look at um, at the map or mapping out the risk reward, uh, who is getting the most of the risks in the innovation process and who is actually getting the rewards. And um, also the government should reward more productive risks and unproductive uh, risks. Uh, that's what actually the risk reward nexus suggests. But according to my analysis, um, if we want to reduce inequality in innovative places, of course, taxation or progressive taxation and the classic measures of redistribution uh, need to be in place. But it seems that uh, one way, and perhaps a promising way, which is so far not utilized, as far as I'm aware in innovation policy, is to create uh, synergies, uh, collective, or say, uh, spaces, uh, strategic spaces among focal actors in innovation systems that they are favorable to inclusive growth. I think the regional brands like uh, underlines that uh, that when innovation or the challenges of the innovation are dealt in a socially inclusive manner. Um, then innovation or innovation system can also reduce inequality. I think this is an interesting policy implication um, that, uh, of course, may be uh, d developed or drawn upon a specific case, uh, but it may be generalizable to other places and, and other regions. Um, I think that is what I have so far. I hope I stayed within the time frame. And, and then and then I guess Manto would like to ask me a few questions or comment on my presentation. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Thanos, for the um, thought-provoking presentation. Um, I wanted, first of all, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, okay? yes I can, yeah. very well. That's great. Um, I wanted to reflect a little bit on your uh, on your work and, and your discussion and your um, uh, recommendations and, yep. and um, first of all share a few of my reflections and then open it up with some kind of questions and and open it up to questions to to the to the forum and um, uh, I whenever whenever I, I look into uh, 
research study, I always, uh, first of all, focus on the why care part. You know, why, why should we even care about innovation and its impact on inequality? And I guess you, you have been very clear in your presentation um, it, about increasing uh, pressures for, for all of us in, in developed and uh, developing uh, economies uh, on, on this uh, notion of inclusive economic growth. And I guess this is something that the OECD is very kind of clear about in terms of its uh, agenda. Uh, but also, you know, from wearing our academic hats, um, the Academy of Management has been very clear uh, in, in talking about the so-called grant challenges. and. Uh, for 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 all of us that have uh, had a look at the grand challenges of the academy it's clear that alleviating poverty enhancing equality uh, gender equality uh, and so forth uh, along with innovation are part of the grand challenges that the academy wants to all of us to to focus on so uh, in terms of the kind of motivation of uh, this study it couldn't be more topical um what I really uh, appreciate in your approach is, um, and, and probably it's because I have a, a hammer and I see nails everywhere, being a paradox, is, is this idea of kind of paradoxical elements that underpin inclusive economic growth, which I guess is at the core of your uh, uh, argument. Um, and uh, I have a few reflections upon this, which uh, I think actually fit quite well with with uh, with your findings and, and your approach. So, I mean, we can debate, I don't know what kind of paradox you see inclusive economic uh, growth uh, referring to. Um, it's probably around kind of the paradoxes of learning that come with innovation, I guess. And... Um, from my point of view, uh, I see some very, very interesting uh, issues uh, arising here. First of all, it's very clear that the the, the paradox that uh, the paradoxes that underpin inclusive economic growth are multi-level, and, uh, and and I, and I think this comes clear in in your findings. You know, so it's not only about kind of uh, uh, the the industry you're talking about differences in cities you're talking about motivating factors you know from people moving from one city to another you're talking about kind of organizational level uh, mm -hmm. uh, issues and individual level issues and uh, f from my point of view uh, um, if i reflect upon what what you've been um, discussing it's not only the fact that it's multi-level, it's also the fact that it is interconnected, right? So the different levels are impacting each other and that is why probably uh, you're seeing all these different mechanisms driving this uh, phenomenon. And then the other interesting thing that I see as a paradox scholar is that, you know, one paradox triggers other paradox. So you have, for example, a paradox of learning that by default quite often uh, requires this creative destruction that you have been talking about. You know, you need to destroy something old in order to create something uh, new. Let's think about technological advancements and so forth. And that then has implications in terms of performance paradoxes because skills that, you know, were prominent in one kind of era are not uh, appropriate for a different kind of technological uh, era. And then you have belonging paradoxes, right? People that were included, for example, uh, at one point are all of a sudden excluded at another point. So um, there are loads of interesting kind of interconnected paradoxes that are also multi-level and, and that's perhaps one explanation as to the co kind of complexity of the phenomenon that you have been describing in a very interesting way. And then the other thing I wanted to, to say before I stop and, and ask a question is uh, uh, I see a, a lot of parallels with kind of perspectives that have been raised in the entrepreneurship literature that talk about ways through which entrepreneurship can uh, potentially alleviate poverty. And I think that fits quite well with the, the agenda that you have um, 
uh, described in the end. And and there's a very interesting article by Sutter, Bratton, and Chen in the Journal of Business Venturing that talks about um, kind of whether, for example, all of this uh, could be potentially solved by uh, focusing on resources, whether that's skills, training, money, uh, uh, communication, um, or whether, for example, um, it's it's more kind of deeply rooted in social exclusion, and and uh, and from my point of view, your recommendation in terms of uh, ways to enable a productive synergy through more kind of inclusive uh, uh, formats of uh, growth possibly resonates with this uh, perspective. Uh, they call it the reform perspective in the entrepreneurship uh, literature. So uh, um, these are these are my reflections. I think it's uh, certainly fascinating and, and, and impactful uh, research. Um, I'm just wondering if if um, we are to kind of focus on your your kind of final reflection, which was around this notion of inclusion uh, in terms of the way forward. How do you see that taking shape from a practical point of view? Okay. okay. Um. Should I answer uh, to Mantos uh, comments or should I uh, wait for the rest or pick up the rest of the questions and then respond to each of them? How we should proceed? Um, I think you can answer, Thanos. Okay, good. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mantos, thank you. I, I think I certainly agree with your paradoxical perspective and I also uh, regard innovation as a paradoxical process. I think uh, innovation is full of paradoxes. On the one hand, it forces us to be creative, but on the other hand, in order to make it work, we have to be reasonable and rational. On the one hand, innovation leads to, uh, let's say, um, it's a dynamic, but also at the same time creates some kind of stability. So. I've seen it also in my analysis that thinking of innovation as a creative destructive process, which sounds like a paradoxical process, I think makes sense because this is actually what is really going on in the world. And and when it comes to inequality, uh, actually the this kind of paradoxical aspects of innovation are central, not only to our analysis, but also to how we can make uh, innovation more inclusive. Um, I see your point about this multi-level perspective. I think, um, yeah, it make yes, of course. I the, in the analysis I've seen it, and and we can see that when it comes to innovation and equality, uh, there is a lot of interaction between different levels. And um, but what I've seen as the most significant one is the organizational level, especially the strategies that organizational actors perform, and not only firms but also the universities and the policymakers, uh, also even. The labor unions as well. So I think this is an important aspect that is actually the strategies of, of those actors that animate uh, the innovation and equality nexus. Uh, it's actually the strategies that determine whether innovation would uh, lead to inequality or, or equality. So this is uh, something I think that deserves more attention. I, I think we tend to neglect that in the literature on innovation and equality, but also in innovation systems literature, uh, we haven't paid so much attention on organizational responses to the challenges of the innovation process. Um, regarding the practical implications, I think um, the way, a good way forward is to create this type of, of what I like to call, uh, let's say, uh, let's say common strategy spaces. I think uh, what we haven't looked upon as as also society is that we haven't looked where uh, the strategies of different actors, uh, organizational actors, you know, converge or where they could converge. I think the practical implication is here that we can join uh, strategies or we can enjoy synergies among different strategies especially the organizations such as universities and research institutes, firms and, and, and the policy organizations in a local context. And, 
and, and create this type of synergies because I think the challenges we're facing, like the grand societal challenges, even getting out of the COVID uh, crisis, require this type of synergies, require this type of, let's say, arrangements, uh, strategic arrangements that uh, they don't contradict each other, but they reinforce each other. I think there is some room there for practical, say, uh, application. And uh, it seems, if I may say, it's promising from a theoretical point of view. But of course, when it's about practice and reality, I think context is significant. And in some cases, I think countries that they have this kind of collective aspect or econom uh, economies that they are more collective, so Germany or Scandinavian economies, seem to be, let's say, uh, more uh, institutionally equipped with this type of uh, collective uh, strategy perspective. But um, I think other, in other countries and in other contexts that might not work so well or it might require more effort to make it work. That's uh, for now. Thank you very much, uh, Thanos. Uh, I'll, I'm looking forward to your answers to the rest of the questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you, Thanos, for your answer. And uh, do we have any questions from the participants? You can just raise your hand and open your microphone if you have any questions. Yes. Daniela, please. Uh, can you open your microphone? Can you turn it on? Yes, yes. coming. Thanos. Hi, Daniele. You look uh, you look wonderful with a beard. Oh, thank you. It's a long time that I didn't see you. Yeah, yeah, it's true. More, we have... more a bit like Karl Marx. Yeah, sure. Reflected <laughs> in your talk, you know. <laughs> yeah. Now, and I see that you have got in your back. Uh, Thomas Piketty, capital in the 21st century. It's true, yes. Well spotted. Very good. Now, I got a very basic question. Yeah. Do you think that we will better deal without innovation just to avoid uh, to generate increasing inequalities? Um, no, I think we need innovation to reduce inequality. If if I heard, did I get your question well? Because my connection wasn't so good. Well, yes, my question. So you, so that's. I mean, I'm trying. I'm I'm challenging you on uh, the normative implications. You, yes. You argue something which is important, namely, we often ignore that mm -hmm. innovation is increasing inequality. You know, mm -hmm. and yep. it's a fact. It's a fact that is quite understandable. Every time there is something new, there are some people which are faster to exploit the benefits of this, you know. But uh, there are also the other side, namely some people will benefit eventually of uh, the new things developed. So mm -hmm. my basic question, how can we balance the two things from the normative perspective? If, mm -hmm. if uh, innovation is generating inequality, Shall we stop innovation just because we don't want to generate inequality? Or do we need to do something different? We can't stop, of course, innovation. Uh, it's definitely we need innovation, but there is room for this type of uh, strategic action, so collective strategic action that I talk. So how firms and organizations respond to the challenges of the innovation process, right? So this is key. And we can still develop innovation and carry on with the superior vision of economic growth, but at the same time, it can be inclusive. I think those two can be combined. It's not that, you know, it can be combined. Um, perhaps we may need a good, a very good institutional arrangement there, as in the past. Uh, and perhaps we haven't spent so much time, uh, both in business sector and also in academia, thinking about what type of institutional arrangement uh, can facilitate inclusive, innovative, inclusive growth in the decades to come. So I think this is a. Uh, what I think about it. I think innovation is definitely needed, but it can also be directed in a way that doesn't create more inequality. And uh, if you have to apply it for the case on which everybody is waiting now, vaccines for COVID-19, we have seen today that companies, uh, even AstraZeneca, which work with Oxford, uh, has made an enormous amount of profits. Moderna mm -hmm. has made an enormous amount of profits. 
So at a certain point, they got something and they're increasing inequality because the richer are getting richer. What mm -hmm. is the practical way in which this can be rebalanced? I think um, this is, uh, we're talking about inequality within a firm and also inequality within a particular field or a sector. And um, what I, I think when it comes to these issues, I would like to think more about innovative places uh, rather than single out firms. Uh, I would like to, to look at cities and regions and even nations and, and, and take a more collective perspective on this. Um, of course, when it comes to, if I would like to, to give you like a kind of an answer, a more clear answer, I think when it comes to this, how we can address it within a firm, I think uh, Lazenica Mazzucato's ideas or suggestions uh, about uh, how to, to do this within the firms, I think uh, are interesting um, in a sense that course increasing taxation for high income people but also uh, looking upon others for like the productive and they are productive risks taken by let's say the state uh, when it comes to support uh, this type of biotech or uh, pharmaceutical innovation so I think in this way uh, there is some interesting uh, ways or interesting possibilities when it comes to addressing inequality within firms but I must say we haven't got much knowledge of how the income that innovation generates is distributed within the firms. I think the innovative firm and how the benefits of it are distributed uh, within the firm as a kind of a black box. You know, even with the field of innovation studies, we haven't really unpacked this. And I, th I think this is an opportunity that we need to uh, explore, uh, both academically and in terms of policy. Uh, we need to see also who gets the most within the firm and how. Um, and I think we just only talk about maximizing shareholders' value and some top managers, but we haven't really figured it out what is really going on within the firm, innovative firm. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for this question. Um, Helen, I see you raise your hand. You... Yes. Um, in the 1990s, I went to, uh, I was in a workshop with uh, Alfonso Gambardella and he was talking about large firms in regions and his argument was that regions need large firms because of the diversity of employment they offer. You, you, you've talked um, about the large firms from different perspectives, the opportunities for gender equality and support for women, but it's also um, the case that they employ less, less skilled people and they have a broader range of employees than the likes of AstraZeneca or Moderna. So have, have you looked at that when you're looking at your region about the, the, the lower skill people that form part of the workforce in that region and, and that impact on inequality? Thank you. Um, yes, I did take it to account. Uh, first of all, thanks for the question. Uh, it's an interesting question. Um, I look upon it and and actually, um, what seems to, to be, say, uh, working there or seems to control or counterbalance inequality is it firms such as Volkswagen and a few other firms that they are, say, um, they are, they've been uh, based in the region for centuries, basically. Um, they have strong labor unions. Um, very strong, like in Volkswagen, most of the factor is 95% of the employees are labor uh, union members. And this somehow um, has a good impact on low skilled people uh, because this protect also that the salaries are relatively good uh, compared to the national average. But the biggest impact is in smaller firms, um, even suppliers of the automobile sector and also other manufacturing firms. I think there is where most of the low skilled people are uh, affected. Um, this is where actually inequality occurs in low skilled people. It's actually the size of the firm seems to be an important factor when it comes to this. And the unionization rate within the firm, um, this also has an impact. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Nana. So, anyone else um, would like to ask a question? Please raise your hand. Uh, 
Uh, I can ask a question, actually. Yes, please go ahead. Okay. Uh, so, uh, you know, I also I do my research on refugee entrepreneurship, so kind of like inclusivity in entrepreneurship and innovation. Um, so I interviewed a young, talented graduate, as I mean, quoting you, who was hired by a large automobile company in Germany, who also happened to be a refugee. And he said, uh, in our company, the assumption is that a German employee is more talented or qualified or uh, worthy than uh, a foreigner until you prove otherwise. He also said that they didn't let him transfer the innovation he developed within the company uh, to the market uh, for years. Um, so he said that uh, he felt there is some sort of discrimination at that point. So the question is, um, how inclusive do you find innovation scene when it comes to leading innovation? Like, do we mostly see natives, locals, uh, or do we see immigrants leading innovation um, like we see in uh, Silicon Valley? I think uh, I said it's an interesting question whether, um, say, the immigration background was taken into account in my analysis. Um, uh, I didn't really go deeper into that issue, um, and because of also nobody mentioned in the interviews, but also because the statistics uh, as well, the labor market statistics in the region show that there's not so many immigrants uh, in overall in the region, maybe 10 percent. Um, then I didn't look into closely, but uh, there were some parts of the organizational documents uh, that analyzed that refer to this. I think uh, there seems to be awareness that uh, they need to be more inclusive, and it seems that Volkswagen and some other firms, leading firms, are, are aware of this. Uh, they want to increase uh, diversity in the also in the board members or the top executives but also within the firm this is what they claimed um at least in the organizational documents the official organizational documents uh, but um uh, i think it's an interesting question to see uh how inclusive is in terms of immigrant background or not but i can confirm the gender inclusive aspect but i can't say that i observed that with immigration but I will uh, take it, actually I will note it down because it's an interesting aspect um, to, to see whether it has an impact or it has not. Thank you, thanks a lot. Thank you. Um, any other questions or comments, actually? Well, I think we, uh, we've run out of time now. So it's, so th thank you, Aisha, for chairing. Thank you, Thanos, for an excellent presentation. Thank you, Manto, for uh, your, your insights into this. And thank you, everybody, for attending. It's been a fascinating debate. Um, it's been really enjoyable. And uh, you can always email Thanos if you've got any questions. And it looks like there'll be a continuing debate between Manto, Thanos, and Anisha, which is which is a great outcome of this. Uh, and uh, thank thank you all for participating and we hope that we'll see you again uh, at the end of march um this is be, be led by uh, uh, matthew jays who is a former master's student and a former uh back employee so we we look forward to you uh, joining us and we'll send you more information about that but um th thank you everybody for for this great event thank you <laughs>